Welcome to this webinar on communication and thank you for joining it. Uh, just before we start, if you can hear properly, can you please type a one in the chat line? Now we're, we're social animals, aren't we? we? We talk all day, we are on social media all day and you would think that communication comes to us easily. But in the clinical setting, often communication is very difficult. And so today I wanna to talk about some of the difficulties with communication in the, in the practice setting with our patients. Then I wanna talk about some of the things that are fearful, uh, some of the fears that we have that make communication more difficult. And then lastly, I wanna talk about a few tools. Now, obviously I can't teach you everything that I know about communication in this webinar, but hopefully I give you some things that are helpful in your practice. One of the most difficult parts of communication for us as dentists is that we're trained to be technical. Our whole degree is a technical degree. There's a very small portion that is on the soft arts, like the how to, how to be emotional, how to deal with emotions, how to, how to communicate. Very much of our degree is on physics and chemistry and maths and, and all those hard, technical, cold, mathematical, unemotional topics. And whilst they're very important, and we can't criticize our dental schools because dental school has to teach us all these technical things. Our degree would be 10 years long if we had to do psychology as well. But it is certain that all that technical focus reduces our ability to communicate with our general patients. The second difficulty is language. Every profession has a language. We have a language that we learn to do dentistry. Bankers have a language. Lawyers have their own language. Lawyers can speak and we don't understand. Everyone has a language and, and that language helps us communicate with absolute precision to other dentists. But it excludes everyone else. Our language is foreign to our patients. They can't understand our dental language. We have words like periodontitis, caries. These are words that the general public don't understand. The third difficulty is complexity. Many of the things that we need to communicate to our patients are very complex. They're not simple little things that are common in everyday life. And to simplify them actually requires a great deal of skill. I mean, we look at this picture by Picasso and it's just a single line. His pen did not lift off the paper. Yet, if you try to do that, you'll realize that there is enormous skill to make something so simple. So that difficulty of being able to take something very complex and simplify it can be difficult when we're younger and less experienced because we don't understand that to simplify something means that you know it very, very well and that you understand it very, very well. So we have some difficulties, but beyond the difficulties of communicating in, in our clinical practice are some fears. I was thinking about four fears that we have. Now, everyone has fears within them. And these fears can make our communication much more difficult. They can undermine it. They can, they can uh, hold us back from really attaching weight to our words. When we're younger, one of the biggest fears that we have with communication is money. When I graduated, I was very poor. And so for me, the cost of dental treatment was a lot to me as a new graduate. And so then to expect another person to, to be able to talk to me about these costs was very, very awkward. And of course, when, once the cost of something gets to the upper limits of our comfort zone, we become emotional. We get emotional feelings about costs that are outside of our comfort zone. Now, for those of you who have done my treatment planning course, RETP, they will know that we, we spend a lot of time talking about the emotional cost there's a price point at which we go from being unemotional as dentists to emotional as dentists. Now that will vary for each person, but when I ask a room full of, say, people in Australia, I'll ask them, you know, at what price, what price does your treatment plan 
go from being unemotional to emotional. Now, for some dentists, it's in Australia, and obviously the cost of dentistry varies around the world. So in each country, there will be a different range. But in, in Australia, some dentists who are just graduated, they start to get uncomfortable at costs of one to $2,000. In some uh, older dentists, maybe four or $5,000. These are the costs of dentistry where they start to become uncomfortable. Another fear is rejection. Everyone has that fear somewhere. Okay, and maybe, okay. You should never say ne always or never. Uh, there will be some sociopaths who have no fear of rejection, okay? But I can't really help you if you're one of those. But for regular people, we all have this fear of rejection. We have this fear of the patient leaving us. And not only that, if we tie it in with the money, sometimes if we've got a new practice, we have this fear that we won't be able to pay our bills. If, if we talk about something too expensive, the patient will run away. And if too many patients run away, we can't afford the loan payments on our practice. We can't afford to survive. So we have the fear of rejection and it's tied into our fear of money. Rejection also stops us from offering people things. So many times we think about a treatment plan and we're, we know that there's complex options available. There's expensive options available. There's options that are a little bit scary for us and we may hold back on them just because we're afraid of the patient rejecting us. One way I've found to overcome rejection is for me to not be invested in the treatment plan. If, if I want the patient to do treatment more than they want to do treatment, then I've become invested. It's become personal to me whether they do treatment or whether they don't, whether they fix their disease or whether they don't. And once we, once we start to take the patient's problem, the patient's disease, the patient's circumstances and make them ours, then we're no longer treating the patient, we're treating ourselves. So one thing to remember, and it was a, it was a joke once I read in a book, was uh, always remember the patient is the one with the disease. Okay? Always remember that the patient is not you. Don't treat yourself, treat the patient. Another fear we have is the responsibility of decisions. So often I hear dentists say, I just give the patient every available option and then allow them to make their decision. But sometimes I don't think that's appropriate. Sometimes I think we need to guide the patient to the correct decision for them. But the problem with helping someone make a decision and guiding them is then we're responsible. And so that's one of our fears is being responsible for the decisions, responsible for the treatment plan, responsible for the words that we have given them that might encourage them one way or the other. And of course, we know so much more about the outcomes, about what goes wrong, what goes well. We know more about those type of things in the patient. And so we don't know as much about the patient. So we need to understand more about the patient, but we can't get rid of the, the responsibility to guide them. And so at some point, quite often when I'm teaching people treatment plan, I say, make a decision and live with it. Sometimes we agonize for hours and hours and hours, but at some point we need to make a decision and then live with it. Of course, in this day and age, in many countries, regulation is very heavy. And this, this can be also something that we become quite fearful. We're trying to communicate, we're trying to be emotional, we're trying to engage, we're trying to do all these things. But on top of that, We've got all these regulatory requirements that, that we're meant to. So we need to tell them all the risks. We need to tell them the outcomes. We need to tell them about the inferior alveolar nerve and that the root canal file could break off. And we have so many things that we have to tell them legally that it can weigh down our mind and can, it can, we can be so afraid of all the things we have to tell them that we, forgot, we forget to actually communicate wholeheartedly. One little thing, I, I will tell you one little tip that I have found with this. When I'm consulting with a patient, I have one of my staff sit there and type everything we say. So everything the patient says, everything I say. And so there's like a transcript of the entire conversation. 
And in a normal conversation with a patient, we actually discuss a great deal of information, a lot of things that are good, bad, and so on. But if we were to try and remember afterwards, it would be very difficult to, and we would want to actually put things in a very logical way as we speak. But that's not how people really communicate. People communicate to and fro with emotion. And so having a dental assistant type everything removes much of that burden. Much of the conversation is there. Much of the informed consent is already documented and you don't need to think about it. It kind, of, it kind of frees a lot of your brain power just to focus on communication. So there's some, uh, some of the difficulties we have and some of the fears that we have that undermine. I want to talk about some tools. There's five tools I was thinking of that we could use to... Uh, help us with our communication with the patient. By far the most important tool that I have ever learned is to focus on the patient's goal. Now, this is a lot more difficult than it sounds. And this is something when we run RETP, we focus a lot on finding the patient's goal. And it, it's not as simple as it sounds. Okay, maybe it's not as easy as it sounds. It is quite simple, but it's not easy. The patient generally won't tell us their goal. So when our patients sit down in our chair, they don't go, my goal is to maintain my teeth for life because I hate dentures. There's a few people that will tell us that, but mostly they don't. Most of the time our patient goes, my tooth is broken. How much is it going to cost? I hate dentists. Okay, they're right. Usually I put that in at the start, but sometimes after that. Now, if someone comes in and says, my tooth is broken, it doesn't tell us their goal. What they've told us is what they have. Uh, we want to know what their goal is, not what they have. In fact, they're kind of doing the checkup for us. They're doing the examination for us and we can see what's going on in their mouth. We can see their tooth is broken. We don't need them to tell us. We don't need the patient to do the checkup for us. So the difference between what they have and what they got, what they want, is a very important uh, part of the goal. So when we're focusing on the goal, we want to know where does the patient want to go, short term and long term. Often I say to my patients, "What do you want?" And they go, "My tooth's broken." I go, "Do you want it fixed? Do you want, does it does the look of it bother you? What do you want?" Because we want to know their where they're aiming. Once we know that the patient, just say the patient says, I don't like how it looks. So if the patient comes in, their tooth is broken, it's a premolar, they say, I don't like how it looks. So we'll just want to clarify that. So your goal is that you want to look better. Yes. We know immediately that we can't repair that tooth with gold because they have told us they want it to look better. And if we use gold, it won't look any better. So you can see how by looking at the goal, it immediately removes some of our treatment options. So you can see that much of communication is learning the patient's goal more and more specifically, asking more and more questions. And with each question we ask about what they want, you know, the patient comes in and goes, uh, I want my teeth to look better. And you go, why don't you like the look of your teeth? They go, <clears throat> because they're really worn down. So you can tell once a patient says that, they're not just there to get their teeth bleached. You go, how long have they been worn down? And the patient goes, ever since I got this denture, the teeth have been wearing down. So before we even look in their mouth, we now know that they're concerned about the appearance of their teeth, so they want things to look better. They're concerned about the function and the wear of their teeth, and we know that they have a denture. And then we can ask them, is the denture comfortable? And if they start saying things like, no, I hate the denture, I've always hated the denture, I would do anything to get rid of the denture, we can start to see where their goal is going. So the goal is they want to look better, they want teeth that are not worn down, and they hate their denture and want it replaced. We can no longer offer them so many options. So from a communication point of view, we have simplified our communication. When we look at the patient now, we go, 
what treatment options have we got? We can go, well, we can't offer them a denture because they hate dentures. So we would mention it just in passing, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. So by more learning more about the patient's goal, so always remember the goal is not what they tell you about, it's what they want. And we have to seek that out because the patients, we have trained the patients to not tell us. When I uh, train people to speak about money, the number one thing that helps is practice. Most dentists have, a, I've already told you, we all have an emotional price. That's a, it's a cost of treatment where we go from being comfortable to being uncomfortable. And when I graduated, my emotional price was $1,000. Now, I've done, I have done a lot of complex dentistry since then, so it's now in Australia. Obviously, this doesn't count for other parts of the world, but in Australia, my emotional price now is around about $60,000. That's where I start to become uncomfortable with the cost of the treatment that I'm talking to the patient about. So what's changed in that time? There's quite a few things that have changed, but number one is practice. I have talked about all sorts of treatment plans over and over and over again. But you don't just have to practice with patients, you can practice uh, just like you would practice public speaking. So when you are new to public speaking, you will practice your speech. You'll actually stand up and maybe do it in a mirror, or you'll do it to a colleague, or you'll do it to a friend. Sometimes you'll just say it out loud. In fact, sometimes that's the hardest practice because speaking out loud to an empty room, in fact, one just like this, is very awkward, and so that's excellent practice. In fact, when you're practicing, the more awkward it feels, probably the better it is. So in particular, when you're talking about money, practice is very important. And I'll show you some little things that everyone does when they're talking in particular about money. In poker, there's a, so for those of you who gamble, there's a card game called poker and poker players, because they're always trying to bluff or manipulate each other, they look for things called tells. So a tell might be when a particular poker player gets a good hand of cards, He'll scratch his eye or he'll twitch or blink his eye. Well, dentists have tells as well. When they start speaking about things they're uncomfortable about, they start to do things like look away. So I'm not sure if the resolution on this camera is good enough, but quite often when I get dentists to practice talking about money, just as they say the price, their eyes look away. And you, in most countries, if you do this, not all, there are some countries where this is okay, but in most cultures, if you break eye contact, just as you talk about money, it means that you're being untrustworthy. It means that you're lying. It means that you're trying to sell something that the patient doesn't need. Now, of course, the reason we look away is because we're uncomfortable. And there's only one way to get over that, and that is practice. You actually have to force yourself to maintain eye contact. If we, Mrs. Jones, if we do the treatment we're talking about, it'll cost about $5,000. Is that something you're comfortable with? I'll give you some other tells. You can't touch your ear. If you touch your ear, if you touch your nose, if you touch your eye, if you touch your mouth, if you touch any part of your face while you're talking about something important, it means that you're being untrustworthy. So you need to practice to remove a tell. Don't make assumptions. The other day I was talking about a case and th I think I posted it on, uh, on my Restoring Excellence page or it might have been on Ripe. Uh, I, I posted a case and it was of an elderly patient and someone said, well, I normally wouldn't have done that sort of treatment for this patient because I thought they're too old. <clears throat> so what they're saying is the patient's going to die so we won't bother treating them. Now, we tend to think more like that when we're younger, but as we get older, we start to realize that we don't want to be treated like that when we're really old. We want to be treated with respect, with dignity, with grace, with kindness. And so we learn to treat other people like that. It's not my decision whether to do crowns when you're 85, because you might live to, in fact, I have a whole bunch of 90 year old patients in my practice. They all have their own teeth and the ones that we did good work on are very satisfied. The ones where we patched up, it's getting difficult. Of course, if you 
<clears throat> when you're trying to make these decisions, how do you decide? How do you decide if it's worth doing work on an elderly patient? How do you decide if you should bleach uh, before you do veneers or after? Well, you don't assume. You don't look at the patient and assume. You don't assume what they can afford. You don't assume how nice they want to look. Um, I once heard a person say, because a 70-year-old lady I was treating, because her denture had a bit of stain, that she wasn't interested in aesthetics. And so it was fine to do a fairly low quality treatment for her because she didn't care. Well, that wasn't true at all. She cared about aesthetics very much, but she was anxious. And so she hadn't had anything done because she was scared, not because she didn't want it. Often we forget that communication is not mostly about what comes out. So mostly communication is actually about what goes in. It's about listening. So if you speak the entire time that you're communicating, you're not doing a very good job, okay? Unless you're trying to mansplain someone, okay? And then, then it's fine, okay? But if you're actually trying to effectively communicate, you need to shush and listen and sit quietly. I find that with patients, many practices are very, very rowdy and they, the patients come in and they go out and there's lots of activity and it's very noisy and bustling. But it's not effective for communication. So often when you want to communicate effectively, you need to be quiet and you need to sit still. In fact, in my consult room, my chair is lower than the patient's chair on purpose. Because if you sit higher than someone, you are taking a dominant position. You're sort of wanting to communicate out, not in. But if you want to listen, it's good to make sure if you're, if you don't have a consultation room like me, then at very least lift the patient's chair up so that their eye is level with your eye. Don't talk down to them. <clears throat> Lastly, time. You cannot communicate effectively and well in a very short time. You can if it's simple. And with, with experience, you will get better. You will communicate faster. You will communicate more efficiently. Often this doesn't take any less time, but you get a much better result. It's a little bit like uh, people who ride bicycles, not, not just to the, to the shops and back, but people who ride bicycles competitively. You know, in Australia, we call them mammals middle-aged men in Lycra. Uh, they say it never gets easier, you just go faster. So when they ride their bike and they're very, very fit and they've been doing it for years, it doesn't hurt less. Their legs still hurt, they still get tired, but they're going much faster than before. So experience with uh, communication doesn't necessarily make it quicker, but it makes it deeper and richer and far more effective. To do this takes time. So as soon as you have a patient, one of the difficulties in our busy practices is we have lots of patients who have tiny little treatments. They just need one tooth fixed. They need their gum treated. They need something very, very simple. And there's not much to talk about. Your tooth is broken. If you can afford a crown, get one. If you can't afford it, get a filling. That's it. It's actually quite funny. Sometimes I hear people talking about a filling, they go, well, you know, the uh, filling is made of a glass reinforced resin and we can do it faster, the dissipate. The only reason, when someone's got a cusp off, the only reason you do a filling over ceramic is because it's cheaper. Very rarely, I mean, I'm not talking about a little occlusal filling, okay? There's no need to do ceramic, but when it's big, the only reason we do composite resin is because it's cheaper. So cut to the chase, your tooth's broken. If you can afford ceramic, get it. If you can't, do a filling. End of communication. Now, those ones don't need a lot of time. They're very simple. But while we're seeing all those simple patients coming through our practice, there's also the ones which come in and they go, I just want to check up, but they've got major problems, big problems. And those are the ones where you need to pick it's kind of like you're sitting there fishing and there's all these little fish, but every now and again, there's a big one. You can't have a river full of big fish. There has to be some little ones 
and the occasional big one. So when you see a big one coming, then you slow down. Those are the ones where quite often in my practice, they need time, these people. They can't just go from a checkup to a very complex, expensive treatment plan just like that. So those patients, I know they need time, I slow down. I bring them back for a second consultation. Sometimes we take models. I, often I don't need the diagnostic models to diagnose. I need a reason to slow them down. And so over four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks, they've slowly got used to this idea that they have major problems. I haven't put it in this presentation, but there's a, one of the most important things to remember with communication is the process of grieving. Now, we often think of grief in relation to death, but there's a whole range of other things that we grieve over and any shocking change, anything that upsets us, anything big and different in our lives. So if we've thought our teeth were fine and we go to the dentist and he says, no, they're not fine, they're all dreadful, it's gonna cost you a lot of money. That is a shock and we will grieve. And you'll see the patient go through the stages of grief. They all go through denial. There is nothing wrong with my teeth. You're just trying to rip me off. Anger. I went to the dentist and he said I needed all this work and he's just lying. That's anger. Bargain. Well, maybe it's, it's not hurting yet, so I think I can leave it a bit longer. Depression. And I hate dentists too. Always good to throw in the hate dentist bit. Always remember when someone says I hate dentists, what they're actually saying is I'm afraid. So every time you hear them say, I hate dentists, what they're actually saying is, I'm afraid. And then acceptance. Now, we know with the grief process that you can get stuck. We know people, even with when it's relating to death, we know people who have had something terrible happen in their lives and they got stuck. They got stuck in anger and bitterness, or they got stuck in denial, or they got stuck in depression. So our patients can do that. And you can't force them through this process, and nor should you try. If you try and force someone through that process, you will just make them sad. So remember, if you have a big fish, you need to go slower. If it's a tiny fish, go quickly. Okay, you can't treat all fish the same. Now, those are some of the things that I use as tools in my practice. Obviously, I go into this a lot more detail in RETP. And in a, once I finish this presentation, I'm gonna take questions. So if you have some questions, please type them into the chat line uh, and we'll answer them at the end. If you've been typing your questions all the time, then thank you. Uh, just some two little tips that I want to go over. The first one is don't project. And I mentioned this earlier in the presentation. We have a tendency to uh, put ourselves in the patient's shoes. Now, it sounds like a caring thing to do. It sounds very empathetic. It sounds very nice to uh, imagine that we're the patient. The problem is that we no longer make good decisions and we no longer can effectively guide the patient because we become all emotional. And also, we're nothing like the patient. So most of my patients can afford less than I can afford. I can afford more than most of my patients. So the cost of treatment is less of an issue for me than it is for my patients. Secondly, I don't have disease in my mouth. So I can't really relate to what it's like to have to spend $20,000 on teeth because my teeth don't have anything wrong with them of any significance, okay? I have brux, so I've lost some enamel. I'll probably need a minimal intervention rehab at some point, but right now I need very little. So I can't really understand what it's like to be a patient. So don't treat the patient the way you want to be treated. Treat the patient the way they want to be treated. That doesn't mean you do something stupid, okay? You always have the right to say no. But often when the patient does something stupid, it's because we haven't explained why. You know, I've talked about this a few of my courses, so if you've heard it before, I apologize, but we know when you get on, the, on an airplane, they tell us how to get off the plane if it should crash. They tell us what to do if you land in water, put the life, jacket on and they tell us to brace like this and don't grab your Gucci bag out of the overhead thing because you'll drown instead of getting off the plane. We never listen to that because it's very boring. 
but we also don't listen because they don't tell us why. And some people did some tests once on how fast you could get people to get off the plane. And so they did that announcement in a very, very funny and humorous way. People got off the plane a little bit faster. Then they actually told people why you do all those things. They told them that if you brace in the correct way, you're far less likely to snap your neck when the plane hits the ground. So if you just stand upright and the plane hits the ground, the shock goes up your spine and your head wobbles on the top of your spine and your neck breaks and then you die. Whereas if you brace correctly, you don't die. Once they started telling people why, everyone got off the plane very quickly. It's very important to tell people why. So if the patient wants to do something stupid, often it's because they don't understand why. So don't pretend you're the patient. Try and understand them, understand what they want, and treat the patient the way they would like to be treated. The second tip I'll give you is to remember your purpose. Now, when I teach communication, quite a lot of people come to, to learn communication and they forget that it's actually about communication, not about trying to sell stuff to people that they don't really need or want. There's many courses that have titles like this, how to get the patient to say yes to treatment, have 100% case acceptance. If you communicate effectively, you won't get 100% case acceptance. Part of your job as a ethical and caring dentist is to actually help your patients to not do things when it's inappropriate. A typical example would be, uh, sometimes patients come to me and they want veneers, but their teeth are very crooked. They're so crooked that I would have to cut all the enamel off the front, all of the dentine off the front, and half the pulp off the front to fit the veneer there. And I won't do that. Now, I will admit that I have done this once in the past. And I, every time I saw that case, I regretted it deeply. That is part of the reason why I have the discipline to say no. Now, the patient comes in and says, I don't want braces. I want you to veneer my teeth. It will be fast. I've heard they do it in, you can go overseas and get it done in three days. Your purpose isn't to get them to say yes to an inappropriate treatment. It's not to get 100% cases. Your purpose is to help them make a good choice for them. Okay, now it's not the best short-term way to make money, but it is a good long-term way. It's a way without regrets and it's a way without angry patients. And if we do that, we would go back to why. And the patient comes in and says, uh, I don't want braces. And you go, if I do veneers on your teeth, when they're that crooked, it is such a bad idea. I won't do it even if you pay me double. But if you go to enough dentists, you'll find someone to do that sort of work. But I won't do it because it's a bad idea. I've told the patient why. So remember, your purpose when you communicate is to help the patient understand what is best for them. It is not to convince them to get an all on four that they don't need or is grossly inappropriate. It is not to get them to have veneers when they should have orthodontics. It is not to get them to have all their teeth pulled out because you can't effectively communicate about periodontal disease. Your purpose is to help them want something that's appropriate. I hope some of these little tools and some of these tips will be useful to you. Uh, for those of you who have done RETP, you'll know that we go on and one of the things I like to do when I teach not any sort of clinical procedure is to remember that the clinical procedure is hopeless without the uh, communication and the implementation skills to make it work. If you can't implement something and you can't communicate something, then the technical skill that you have learnt is useless. So we need to remember that the, the foundation of everything we do rests on our ability to communicate. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now look at some questions. Uh, I'll be bringing them up in a moment. I just want to say I really appreciated that so many of you, there was, uh, we we're getting close to uh, uh, a thousand people coming on for this. So I really appreciate that. 
Dr. Michelle, my associate who works with me, has got some of the questions, so she's going to join me in a moment and uh, we'll have some of those questions coming up and I'll try to answer them. Now, if there's questions on there that, uh, that weren't, uh, I can't answer today, then I will try and, I will try and uh, answer them later in the week. Dr. Michelle? Hi everyone. So one of the questions that was mainly asked was, how do you deal with the window shopper patient? Okay, so you can't actually change a patient. Now I have had all sorts of consultants come to my practice and tell me uh, all sorts of methods that will do all sorts of magical things like convert every window shopper to an effective patient that will get all your patients to say yes, and here's the best one, will eliminate cancellations, okay? Now, every time someone tells me they will eliminate cancellations, I have a good laugh because I've been to the practice of some of the people who promised this, and guess what I saw in their appointment book? Cancellations. So, the window I have learned over my career that I can't make someone value quality. They either value quality or they don't. Now, I can help them see the, some of the value of it, but they kind of do or they don't. So the window shopping patient, it depends what it is. One thing I have heard, and it is a little bit helpful, is to ask them questions. So if the patient says, how much is a filling, then you ask them questions. You can go, uh, tell me what sort of filling is it that you need? And the patient will then go, I'm not sure. And you go, well, is it uh, composite resin or is it amalgam? Is it glass element of cement and all these sorts of things. Okay, but at the end of the day, I have tried these techniques. At the end of the day, the patient wants a range. Now, I think part of that is what they're wanting to know is that they won't come to your office and be embarrassed. Uh, so sometimes you just have to give them a range. You go, if the filling is, in my office, it ranges from $250 to $580. So the answer to that question is, how do you deal effectively with the window shopper? Try your best. I don't actually know. Uh, I have tried all the things that the gurus say and sometimes some people just want to call every dentist until they find the cheapest one. Something that is helpful sometimes is go, oh, if you want cheap, how cheap do you want to go? I know all the really cheap people I can send you there. Uh, but the best one, I of all the techniques I've tried, the best one is to ask some more questions and then if you really want to get fancy, you can go, we have a free report that we can send you about fillings. Would you like us to send it to you? And then you get the patient's contact details. If you have a database, you can get them in the database. Any, what's next? Great, so we've got, how do I turn away a difficult patient without making it obvious? <laughs> I love these questions. Um, how do you turn away a difficult patient without making it obvious? Uh, Generally, when I turn them away, I want it to be obvious. I go, I had a lady the other day and she was, she was complaining. She, every time she comes, she goes, you're three times more expensive than the other dentists I went to, Lincoln. And I said, if you say that to me one more time, you're out of here. So in that case, I was being pretty obvious. Uh, if you don't want it to be obvious, what you do is every time they call you, you make sure they can't get in for eight to 12 weeks. And then just before they come in, you go, oh, Dr. Harris is away, we'll have to rebook you, and the next appointment is in three months' time. So that's the best way to uh, make it obvious. It depends what's difficult about them, though. I have some patients who forget their appointment. So the first time we, they forget, the first time they forget, we don't mind so much. The second time they forget, we require full prepayment for all future appointments. So they have to pay for the entire appointment non-refundable or we don't make them one. So that's a nice way to help the patient either become less difficult or to leave. Uh, well, the best one is just book them a long way ahead and then keep moving their appointment. And they'll get a bit annoyed. I don't know whether it's any better than just telling them to not come. I have had one patient who, uh, I had one male patient who made my female staff feel very uncomfortable and I just wrote him a letter saying, you made my staff feel very uncomfortable with the way you acted. Uh, you will have you have 30 days to find another dentist. Um, 
he obviously knew that he was facing sexual harassment charges if he came back, so he went somewhere else. That's obviously pretty obvious. Great. So how do you explain to patients why they need to come back for another consult? With, okay, the patients that come back for a, big, a second consult are usually the ones that are complex. Now, people hear with their ears, but we're very visual and we believe things we see. Now, we shouldn't believe what we see because our eyes are easily tricked, but we do. So every single new patient in my practice gets a full set of photos. So it's a full face, smile, uh, often quarter face, side of the head, smile from the front, the side, the other side, retracted front, side, other side, retracted front, open. So we've got all these photos that we take on every single patient. So what you do if you need them to come back is you pull up the photos and go, you know, Mr. Smith, you have a lot of complex issues here. Is it something that you, you've got significant wear of your teeth? You've told me that you want your teeth to last your entire life. You're only 50. Now here's a communication tip. Always say people are young. If they're 50, sir, you're very young. I've got patients who are 95. If they're 60, ma'am, you're very young. I've got patients who are 95. If they're 94, you go, how are you, young lady? And then they'll buy a venture off you just like that. Um, so the, uh, I forget the question. What was the question again? <laughs> how do you get people into another consult? Yeah, so second consult, you need photographs. That's the first thing. And you need to awaken their concern. So you point out things about their mouth. You can't just tell them. You have to let them kind of join the dots. Uh, that process, it's very tricky to explain over a webinar. Uh, generally, if you show them photos and then show them some of the things that are going on and, and you know their goal, and their goal includes not losing teeth, then uh, they will have enough concern. Now, if there's a barrier to the second consult, you can do it for free, but mostly I just go, you know what, John, you have all these issues to talk about. You've got worn teeth, you've got gum disease, you've got missing teeth, you've got broken teeth. You haven't been to a dentist for 20 years. I don't think I can go over all of this with you in 10 minutes. Why don't you come back in a few weeks' time if you want to talk about it with your wife, bring her along too, uh, and we will go over this in a bit more detail. Now, if they don't want to do that, then they're not interested. And if they're not interested, don't try. So a very important aspect of communication is accepting what the patient wants and what they say. So if they say, I'm not interested, it's not your job to keep pushing them, okay? That's called harassment, okay? It's just... Offer them something, and if they take it up, then you bring them with you. If they don't, then you go, right, I'll see you in six months for your next checkup. So any tips for the front office staff to talk to their patients to get, emergen to get them from an emergency to a more comprehensive treatment? No. We bring emergency patients straight in, and we treat the emergency, but the thing that we do, we treat an emergency patient like a new patient consultation with some treatment attached. So for us, we don't really, some practices make a lot of money treating toothaches. They see them very quickly and they generate very high hourly rates, but we don't. For us, the emergency patient is a new patient consultation with treatment attached if we have time. So what that means is they come in with their toothache, we numb them up, we go through the diagnosis, we anaesthetize, once you've got the patient anaesthetized, then we take a full set of photos. I don't charge for the photos, we take them. And then we, while they're going numb, we'll sit there and show them all the stuff. Now, if there's things the patient is interested in, they will naturally then convert from an emergency patient to coming back as a consultation. If they don't, you won't be able to make them. Now, just remember this. Trying to make a patient who doesn't want comprehensive care come back for comprehensive care is like hitting your head on an elephant. It hurts your head, it annoys the elephant, makes no difference whatsoever. So if you want to hurt yourself, try and convert people who don't want comprehensive care to have it. That's different from the patient who is afraid. Now, I spend a lot of my 
time marketing to patients who are afraid because the, the patient who is fearful and anxious about dentists often has problems and toothaches because they haven't been for a long time. Those patients you can convert. The patients who don't care about their teeth, uh, you can't really, it can be hard to convert them to care. They have to reach a stage in their life where they have they begin to care. Now, often that happens with middle-aged families once the kids leave home and the parents have a bit more money, then often they start to care, okay? And at that point they go, right, I wanna put all the teeth back that I had extracted while I have bringing up my kids. Do you still mention every treatment option or does guiding the patient to a certain option involve omitting certain treatment options? If so, mm -hmm. are there any medical legal issues? Okay, so I've actually talked to some of the experts on medico legal issues and you don't, under informed consent, you don't have to offer the patient every option. Sometimes you don't have to offer them more than one. So it is not necessary to offer every single option to reach informed consent. And when I hear dentists say, I gave the patient every option, I laugh to myself and go, you're lying because the average patient that comes into my office, if you took that patient to 100 dentists, the total number of options that they might come up with might be 50 or 60 or 70. There is no dentist on earth that offers their patients 60 different options. You know, we could do a partial denture with a, a gingerly encroaching clasp, we could get one with circumferential clasp, we could have one with precision clasp, we could have it in a noble metal, a non-noble metal, in a cheap metal, we could have it milled, we could have it sintered, we could have it 3D laser printed, even rhymed, okay? We can make a wrap about this. So you don't have to offer every option. Now, if you say to the patient, why are you here? What's your long-term goal? And they go, my denture falls down. I hate my denture. I don't want something covering the roof of my mouth. I want something that's solid. Do you have to offer them a full removable denture? I don't think so because if you do, you've just not listened to them. Now, the only time you would offer someone an option that, that is not appropriate to their goals is if it's impossible. So I have some people come in and they want full mouth implants, but they have no bone, they have a medical history that's very long and complicated, and they have no money. So in that case, full arch fixed implant dentistry is not appropriate. So those patients, I'll go, you know what? I really can't do anything for you but a denture. I don't mind if you don't do anything. So you can see that if we listen to the patient, there's less option. Now, if there's things that you think you should mention for legal reasons, then I'll just mention them. I'll go, look, you could do a partial denture, you could do a bridge, you could do implants. I really don't think a partial denture is appropriate and I don't think a bridge is appropriate because the adjacent lateral incisors are perfectly intact and you have nice thick bone ready for an implant and you're the right age and everything's good and your gums are good and you don't smoke. In that case, it's a no-brainer. You wouldn't offer the patient a bridge unless you were concerned. You know, maybe if the patient was a model and had a high lip line and had the most beautiful smile and you're worried if I put implants in and it goes wrong, it could completely ruin her or him. Uh, then, you know, so... There's no hard and fast rules, but no, you don't have to offer the patient every option and it's not necessary to reach informed consent. Do you explain all the risks to your patients on every treatment? Does it ever scare them away? Uh, this is an interesting one. People go, you know, we often, because I teach implant stuff and I was teaching it with Tom and I'm going, you know, mentioning all the risks that you could have with, say, a lower implant. We could go through the nerve and your lip could be numb. And then dentists go, well, if you tell them all that, what if they say no? And I go, that is the whole point of informed consent. The point of informed consent is not to avoid all your legal responsibilities while you get them to sign up to treatment. The point of informed consent is for them to be informed and to make a decision. So no, it rarely scares them away. But see, I'm not afraid of it either. I, I'll tell you what scares patients away. Patients are scared of the same procedure that the dentist is scared of. So if you're scared of soft tissue grafting, so will your patients be. If you're scared of implants, your patients will be scared of it too. If you're scared of block grafts, your patients will be scared of that. 
So whatever you're scared of, the patient will also be scared of. And remember when they say, will it hurt? They're not negotiating, they just want to know. So when I'm doing a, if I'm doing a soft tissue graft and the patient, and I'm going to harvest tissue off the roof of the mouth and the patient says, will it hurt? I go, yes, it will. And they go, okay. So yes, it does scare them away, but the patients who are scared by the, the, the risks are the ones that should be scared. And that is the point of informed consent. What do I do if a patient is unconcerned or doesn't really care, but still wants one tooth fix? Fix the tooth. <laughs> Might be the one. <laughs> fix the tooth and don't hit your head on an elephant. So if the patient is unconcerned, then you should be unconcerned. You go, there's other issues here and they could cause you a lot of problems. Are you concerned? They go, no. Now, if the patient has said, I don't want to ever end up with dentures and they're still unconcerned, you go, right, well, which one is it? Because you're saying you don't want to have dentures, but that's that direction, but you're heading over here towards dentures. Which way do you want to go? Okay, so sometimes once the patient understands where they're heading, a lot of patients don't understand that just because your teeth don't hurt doesn't mean they're not a complete mess. Now, I have a lot of little sayings that I use to explain these types of things. So I try and put it in terms that they will understand. Uh, a typical example is, but my tooth doesn't hurt. And I go, well, my engine is still running, but that doesn't mean there's oil in it, okay? You don't drive your car until the engine stops and then go, oh, maybe it's run out of oil. I'll tip oil in there. And then you go, oh, it costs so much to put oil. I've got to put a new engine in every time I put oil in. So the patient will understand that. And they will understand that you can't tell how much oil is in the engine without pulling the dipstick out and having a look. So once you help them understand that you can't feel problems in teeth until the tooth is ruined and it's going to be very expensive. Uh, <clears throat> did that answer the question? I can't remember. So that's one of the techniques I use, but if they're uncon... There's people who are unaware. So it's not that they're unconcerned, it's that they're unaware of what's going on in their mouth. Those patients you can convert to more comprehensive care. But the ones who are just don't care, like I have a friend who, <clears throat> I have a friend that likes to have a, he's got a sports car and he tunes it up and he races it on the quarter mile and sees how fast he can drive 400 meters in his car. He spends all his time making his car more and more powerful, okay? Now you imagine if he said to, if he tried to convince me to be concerned about how fast my four wheel drive, went 400 meters. I just don't care, okay? It's like I have friends who have <clears throat> push bikes that cost $5,000 and are made out of spaceships or something. I don't care about riding bikes. So I have a bike that costs $200 and is probably made of rust. Um, so you can't make everyone value everything. That's the important part of communication called acceptance. That's where you learn to accept that the patient has different goals, they have different values, different desires to you. And if they don't, if they would rather buy a new engine for their car so they can go 400 metres and lose all their teeth, that's their choice. Does your DA take part in communication with the patient in any way? Yes. My DA, uh, first of all, they type the entire conversation that we have. Secondly, when we actually have written uh, informed consent. Now, if you go to restoringexcellenceacademy.com, uh, the actual academy site, not just the uh, training site, there is one of our cons uh, informed consent forms on there for free. They're one of the legal ones that they sign. There's also, uh, there's also several other ones that you can only get if you're on the paid site. So uh, yes, they, they go through that. I tick all the boxes and they go through that. Uh, and there's often when I go out of the room, they sit there and answer all the questions because often the patient is afraid to ask me everything that they're thinking of because I might make them feel silly. So they will then ask the dental assistant who is doing the consultation. Okay, we've got time for one more question and then it's time to say good night. So thank you for staying with us this long. Great. So how do you deal with a patient that says they want a crown on a particular tooth but we know the rest of their mouth is not in the best condition. So how do we give them okay, a so option? 
Uh, those sort of patients are unaware. Now, you have to remember that there's a whole range. Okay, there's not, there's not a line. There's not a line where all the patients on this side, they can't have a crown unless you fix everything, and all the ones on this side can have a crown just on one tooth. Okay, that's why it's difficult. There is this constant gradual change from one to the other. So there are obviously patients, if they've worn their teeth right down to the gum, then you definitely can't do one front crown. But then you've got the ones who've got a little bit of wear. So that is where understanding the patient's goal is very important. You go to the patient. Now, your teeth are all very worn. Is this bothering you? Are you happy with the look of it? Does it concern you? Uh, will it be a long-term problem for you? Because if I do this crown on your front tooth and next year you go, oh, please build up all my other teeth, then I will have to cut your crown off and do it again when I do everything else. Now, I don't mind doing that because I get to charge you twice, but I'm just wondering if you're, if you're okay with that, okay? Because uh, that's a risk that you have to take. Now, if they're not sure, then sometimes you might just want to do a temporary crown, a provisional crown or a filling or something, go, look, you're not sure yet, it's too soon. Why don't we just do a filling and we'll come back and talk about this overall and if you still don't want to do anything else, then we'll do a crown. So uh, that's how I deal with that. But you need to remember, it's okay for the patient to have worn teeth. If they want to have bad teeth, they can have bad teeth. Uh, just don't do something that's grossly inappropriate, but there's all these patients where the... Uh, you know, there's no fixed line between whether they should get it all done or whether they shouldn't. Okay, one more. Last one. This is the last one, and then I'm going to go to bed. It's nearly 9 o'clock, nearly bedtime for me. <laughs> How do you end up treatment planning so quickly in a short time? Practice. If you do it thousands and thousands of times, it gets quicker. Uh, actually, that's the real reason. It's practice. If you do stuff over and over, you get better at it. So... Now, most of the time, I don't need a lot of time to plan the treatment. I've done this sort of thing. I'm not afraid of orthodontics or bone grafts or implants. I don't care. Whatever I've got to do to achieve the, the, the result, I can plan very quickly. The hard part of treatment planning is not the treatment planning. It's, okay, there's, there's three parts to treatment planning, okay? Number one is the examination, what the patient has, Okay, then you've got the goal of what the patient wants, and then you've got what the patient can afford. Okay, so, so that's really treatment planning in a nutshell. You've got what they want, what they have, and getting from what they have to what they want at a budget they can afford in a process that they will put up with. So that is the hard part, and that is the bit that takes time. So I can plan the treatment just like that, because I've done it a lot of times. Now, when if you're having trouble planning treatment is because you're not focusing on the patient's goal. You're focusing on your lectures from university or all the things that you've got running around inside your head. But if you focus on their goal, it eliminates many of the treatment plans. Now, if you're still having trouble, it's because you personally are afraid of the procedure. So if you're afraid of bone grafting, then that will be a big problem for you when you're treatment planning. If you're afraid of implants, if you're afraid of orthodontics, whatever you're afraid of will hinder your ability to treatment plan. So I don't need very long to treat the plan because that's just practice, but I still need often quite a bit of time to bring the patient with me. That bit takes time. And I have tried to rush it in the past, but you really need to give the patient time. Now, some people are ready to go. I had a patient recently, her treatment plan was $69,000, and she pretty much came in and she said, I can afford it, I want it, you've done treatment for me before, bang. She sat down from about an hour and a half to when she sat down, she walked out the door with this treatment plan. That happens, but there's many more where I have to bring them back for a second consultation, diagnostic wax up. I don't really need the wax up to treatment plan. I just need an excuse to slow down the time and build a relationship up with them. Thank you. Now, thank you so much for watching tonight. Uh, I will go back and look at some of the other questions and see if I can answer them later. Uh, there will be another webinar coming up on a different topic. Uh, my staff have decided what my topics are, so I don't even know. It'll be a surprise for me too. Um, so join that. Uh, if you And I'll look at all your comments. If you've enjoyed it, please send us a message because uh, I'd love that. Thank you very much. And I hope you could understand my accent. I can't change it, so if you couldn't understand, 
you still won't understand next time. So thank you. Mm -hmm.